Hello everyone and welcome back to another quiz time! My name is Asher, the quiz master, and I'm here to test your knowledge. Before we get into our questions for the night, let's go over our last quiz. That's right, Mr. Quizmaster. It's time to check your answers, boys and girls, to yesterday's quiz. Art safety. Question number one. What was the cause of Lucifer's fall? Well, his heart was full of pride and envy. That's right, boys and girls. He wanted what didn't belong to him, and he fell because of that. Question number two. Why did God pick Noah? Noah was one of the faithful few that loved God. That's right, boys and girls. He was faithful to God, and God did an amazing thing with him, his life, and even his family. Question number three. How long did Noah work on the ark? The answer is A, 120 years. That's right, that's a very long time to be working on a project. Talk about dedication. Remember, boys and girls, to submit your answers to the email address on screen. Now over to you, Mr. Quizmaster. Remember, at the end of each quiz, there's going to be a link to questions where you can submit your answers and have your name entered to have some amazing prizes. Tonight's quiz is Born to Save the World. Here's tonight's exciting quiz question. Are you ready? Question number one. What were the Jews hoping the Messiah would do? A. Usher in the new year of Jubilee. Is it B. Free them from the Romans. Or was it C. Teach the world about climate change. That's A. Usher in the year of Jubilee. B. Free them from the Romans. Or was it C. Teach the world about climate change. Question number two. What did the angel tell Joseph about the name of the baby? Is it A. His name would be Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Is it B. His name would be Jacob because he would supplement the ruler of, his, of this world. Is it B. His name would be Jacob because he would supplement the ruler of the world. Or is it C. The name would be Isaac because he would bring joy to the world. That's A. His name would be Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Or is it B. His name would be Jacob because he would supplant the ruler of this world. Or C. His name would be Isaac because he would bring joy to the world. Question number three. What role does the Bible play in the story of Jesus? Is it A. Instructs us on the do's and don'ts of life. Is it B, gives us a history of creation? Or is it C, teaches us who God is and tells us how we can be saved through Jesus? That's A, instructs us on the do's and don'ts of life. Or is it B, gives us a history of creation? Or is it C, teaches us who God is and tells us how we can be saved through Jesus? And that's it. Three questions every night. Remember to submit the answers the link you see on the screen so you can be entered in to win prizes. Good luck! My name is Asher the Quizmaster and I'll see you next time when we test your knowledge. Now back to our host for the night. Who am I? I am your constant companion. I am your greatest helper or your heaviest burden. Those who are great, I have made great. Those who are failures, I have made failures. Show me exactly how you want something done and after a few lessons, I will do it automatically. If you train me and are firm with me, I will serve you well. If you don't control me, I will destroy you. Who am I? The answer is habit. Everyone has at least one habit. The truth is, we all have habits. This morning when you got dressed, you put one arm in before the other. Which was it, right or left? Maybe you don't even know, but every time you get dressed, you do it that way. It's a habit. If you put a button-down shirt, you start buttoning at the top or the bottom. 
You pushed each button through the hole in a certain way. You didn't think about doing these things. You just did them out of a habit. Habits are things we do without having to think about it. You don't think about how you are going to eat and eat an ear of corn on the cob. You just do it. Most of what we do is based on habits. Many habits save us time and energy, but not all habits are good for us. Bad habits can drag us down. They can destroy our health and our friendships. They can keep us from being a, su a success at school and at work. They can also keep us from connecting with God. Do you think you need to change some of your habits? Maybe you should turn off the TV and use the time to read and study. Maybe you need to replace junk food with healthier choices. Maybe you ought to spend less time on the internet and more time with God. Perhaps you realize you need to give your worries to God and trust Him more. It could be that you've tried to change a habit and given up in despair. If so, there's good news. You don't need to be controlled by your habits. You can change. That's why this presentation is called Bet You Can. God designed habits to be hard to change. Just imagine what it would be like if we forgot all our habits every day. We'd spend all our time trying to decide how to walk, when to blink our eyes, and which way to brush our teeth. But God also made it possible for us to get rid of our bad habits and form new, better ones. To understand how habits work, we need to look at the way the brain sends and receives messages. Your brain is the control center of your body. It contains about 100 billion nerve cells, called neurons. These neurons are very small, but very important. Neurons form pathways to send and receive messages from every part of your body. The messages travel very, very quickly from one neuron to another. Each message travels from the long sending fiber of one neuron. This sending fiber is called an axon. The message is picked up by the receiving fibers of the next neuron. The receiving fibers are called dendrites. When the same axons and dendrites are used over and over again, they form little bumps called boutons. These are where the messages jump from one nerve cell to the next. The more boutons a nerve cell has, the more easily it can send its messages. This is where habits are born. When we repeat any thought or action over and over again, boutons form on our nerves. This makes it easier to repeat that thought or action. Soon, a little habit pathway forms in our brain. It's like what happens when we take a shortcut across the lawn. When we walk across once, it hardly makes a difference. But as we walk on the same place in the lawn day after day, a path begins to form. Soon the path becomes worn and deep. Our feet naturally follow that path. The pathways in our brain are much the same. This is why we find ourselves doing the same habit again and again. And once these pathways are formed, they never go away. But this doesn't mean we are stuck with all the bad habits we have ever made. We can change. We can form new, good habits that are stronger than the old, bad ones. It is hard at first because we naturally want to follow that old, familiar way. But if we keep at it, we will soon have a new habit that is stronger than the old one. For most people, it takes about three weeks to form a new habit. It is usually best to work on just one new habit at a time. When that habit is firmly established, then start on another. Suppose you want the habit of drinking more water. It helps if you think about how much water you want to drink and when you will drink it. Find a way to remind yourself to do this. Maybe set an alarm or write yourself a little notes. You might even plan a little reward for yourself when you drink enough water. All these things will help you form a new habit. At first it might seem hard, but soon you will find yourself drinking water without even thinking about it. You have just formed a new, a new habit. What will you tackle next? How about getting rid of that junk food in your diet? You can form a new habit of eating better, healthier food. And soon you will find that you prefer it to the junk food that harms your body and mind. And don't forget to form a habit of spending time with God every day. This is the most important habit you can have. The part of the brain where habits are formed is a frontal lobe. As scientists have studied the frontal lobe, they have discovered something amazing. You can actually determine how your brain will develop. They discovered that a habit begins with the thoughts. Just by thinking about doing something, you start to make pathways in your frontal lobe. Suppose you see a billboard about drinking alcohol. 
The thought grows in your mind, and if you don't chase it off, it will grow. As you think about something, it becomes more important to you. It becomes a feeling that you want to do something about. If you have allowed the thought about drinking to grow, you now begin to want to try alcohol. This feeling makes a pathway in your brain a little deeper. Before you know it, the feeling becomes an action. You actually do the thing you have been thinking about. If you have allowed the, the thought and feeling to grow, when you have a chance, you will try alcohol. The thought becomes an action and the pathways gets bigger. As you repeat the action again and again, it becomes a habit. If you keep drinking alcohol, you will soon find you have a drinking habit. The pathway becomes deep and firmly established. This is the way the brain works. Your frontal lobe develops rapidly through the preteen and teen years. The parts of your frontal lobe that you use as a young person will grow stronger. The parts you don't use will get weaker until the neurons actually wither away. And habits you are forming right now will determine your character. Your habits actually decide who you are. If you spend time serving others, this part of your frontal lobe is strengthened. If you concentrate on creative skills like writing, art, and music, your frontal lobe will develop in these areas. If video games are your life, another section of your frontal lobe will develop. If you make developing a relationship with God a priority, this part of your brain grows and flourishes. After your teens, the part of your frontal lobe that you don't develop actually wither away. What is saved and what withers away depends on your own choices. You determine your own brain development. You have a unique opportunity to shape your life, and the habits you develop right now will determine your character. It's your call. This is very serious because your character decides your destiny, whether or not you will spend eternity with Jesus. Do you want to form new, better habits? If so, you don't, you don't have to do it on your own. God promises to help you. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 Jesus never asks us to do something that is impossible. When we choose to give our will to Him, He sends His Holy Spirit to help us and form new habits that will last forever. And that's why I say to you, bet you can. Good evening. Would you like to hear some exciting news? I have something exciting to tell you tonight. You'll hear them during this program, Journey Beyond the Stars. First, I have a little quiz for you. Here's the first question. What were the names of the two people who ever lived? Adam and Eve. Yes, the names are Adam and Eve. Where did Adam and Eve live after they were created? The Garden, the garden of Adam. No, in the Garden of Eden. Were Adam and Eve happy in the, the Garden of Eden? Yes. Yes, they were perfectly happy. Do they know anything about sin or pain or death? Yes. No. They only knew happiness. Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat the fruit from how many trees? One. Yes, one. They could not eat the fruit from just one tree. Who was in that tree? A squirrel fish. <laughs> Satan was there. Oh, what kind of creature did Satan pretend to be? A squirrel fish. He pretended to be a snake. Did Adam and Eve disobey God and eat the fruit from the tree? Yes. Yes, they ate the fruit. What did Adam and Eve have to do after they disobeyed God? Leave the garden of Eden. Very good. You are a semi-good listener. Oh, in tonight's <laughs> message, Malachi will be sharing an amazing Bible story. Bible story! Hi. Cut. Good evening, everyone. My name is Malachi. Let me tell you a Bible story. God planned for Adam and Eve to live forever, but they sinned. They disobeyed God. Now they could not be allowed to live forever. Where there is sin, there is sadness and pain. This is why God could not let sin stay in heaven. It would ruin everything forever. God's eternal law says, the wages of sin is death. That is Romans chapter 6, verses 23. Death? This is not just the kind of death that happens when you get old or get sick and die. Sin brings eternal death. Death 
forever and ever. Adam and Eve sinned. Now they must die the eternal death. But Jesus loved them so much that he told God the Father, I will die for them. I will go live on earth. I will take their punishment. God and Jesus knew that the plan was risky. It could only work if Jesus himself did not sin. If he sinned, he would also need a savior. But Jesus was willing to take that risk. He would come to earth just like we came, as a tiny baby. He would live on earth. He would face all the trials and temptations we had. And he, ov overall, he would overcome Satan the same way we can. Imagine the king of the universe coming to our sad world. Imagine him living like us. Jesus wanted to do it because he loves us so much. When Jesus came to this world, Satan was glad. He thought, now I can win. I will get Jesus to, to sin and I will spoil his plans. Jesus will be my servant. Every day, Satan tried to get Jesus to do wrong. No one has ever been tempted as much as Jesus was. But Jesus did not sin. Here is how Jesus kept from doing wrong. Jesus prayed. Jesus spent time praying to his Father in heaven. Sometimes he prayed all night. Jesus knew that God was the source of his strength and power. Jesus studied the Bible. He memorized many, many Bible verses. When Satan came with a temptation, Jesus answered with the words from the Bible. Jesus asked for God's grace to keep him from sin. Can we do all these things too? Yes, we can. We can have victory just like Jesus did. Jesus lived on earth for more than 30 years. During that time, Satan tried to get Jesus to sin. But Jesus did not sin, not even once. Satan saw that it would be even harder if he had to decide to make people hate Jesus. He would want them to hate them, him so much that he would have to kill him. But the people loved Jesus. The people were so kind to him. He healed the sick. He taught them about the kingdom of heaven. The people loved to listen to Jesus. They told each other, this must, must be the Messiah. Let's make him our king. Jesus was on earth. The nation of Rome ruled the world. The Jewish people did not like to be ruled by Rome. They hoped that when, when the Messiah came, he would deliver them from Rome. The people tried to make Jesus their king, but he would not allow it. Jesus came to deliver them from their sins. Sin is much greater than the enemy of Rome. When Jesus would not be king, the people were disappointed. Satan whispered to them, If Jesus were the Messiah, he would have already delivered you from Rome. He must not be the Messiah after all. The Jewish leaders met together and talked about Jesus. They decided to kill him. Late one night, they sent a soldier to arrest Jesus. They made fun of Jesus. They spat on him, slapped him in his face, and pushed him a crown. Uh, they pushed a sharp crown of thorns on his head. They beat him with a whip. Finally, they nailed Jesus to the cross on a hill called Calvary. Jesus could have asked to send a thousand of thousands of angels to help him. His angels could have stopped the wicked men, but Jesus did not do all that. Jesus gave up his life on the cross that day. He died because he loves us so much. He died to pay the price for our sins. What is the price? Well, the price is death. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verses 23. Jesus died for us so that we could live with him forever. The wicked men who killed Jesus did not understand that Jesus was dying for them. Jesus died on the sixth day of the week. What was that day? Yes, it was Friday. Jesus was buried in the tomb that very day. The soldiers stood in front of him, in front of the tomb, guarding it. Jesus stayed in the tomb all that next day. It was the Sabbath. Jesus rested on the in the tomb on Sabbath. On Sunday, the first day of the week, the soldiers were still standing guard. Early that morning, there was a great earthquake. A bright shining angel came down from heaven. The angels rolled open a huge stone door of the tomb. The angel called out, Son of God, come forth. Your father calls you. 
The soldiers were not brave anymore. They shook with fear and fell down on their faces. Now they knew that they had killed the Son of God. Jesus came out of the tomb with the angels that sang with joy. Jesus is alive. He was alive forevermore. Jesus stayed with the, his disciples for 40 days. He told them many things, but he could not stay. He had work to do in heaven. After 40 days, Jesus went back in heaven. He is there now, but soon he is coming back to earth. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he told his disciples that he would be leaving them. The disciples did not want Jesus to go. Jesus told them, do not be troubled. I am going to heaven to prepare a place for you. Then he gave them a special promise. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That is John chapter 14 verses 3. Jesus is coming back with his angels. He promised he is coming back for the people who love and serve him. He is coming to take us to heaven. Then we can live with him forevermore. Jesus' promise is for us today. Let's read it together. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That is John chapter 14, verses 3. Did Jesus say he would never come back? No. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That is John chapter 14, verses 3. He first came to the earth as a tiny baby. He promised to come again. We call this the second coming. When Jesus comes, what will he do? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus loves us so much that he wants us to be wherever he is. John chapter 14 verses 3 reminds us that Jesus is coming soon. He promised, say it with me, Jesus is coming soon. Jesus knows the future. That's why he could promise that he would come again. Jesus told his, his disciples many things about the future. From the very beginning of time, Jesus told his prophets many secrets about the future. Jesus told Daniel the prophet that he would come to this earth as a Messiah. He also told Daniel that he would die for our sins. Jesus warned his prophets of the time where God's people had to hide. They would have to flee from the wicked men who wanted to kill them. He said they would have to hide in the mountains for 1,260 years. This happened just as Jesus said. Jesus told his prophets that when his persecution time was over, it would be close to the end of time. We are in that, that time today. We know that Jesus is coming very soon. The Bible tells us so. The Bible tells us that what will happen before Jesus comes, it will say that Satan will pretend to be Jesus. He will fool many people, but we don't have to be fooled. Jesus told the prophets just how it will be when he comes. The Bible says when it is the time when Jesus comes back that the sky will roll together. There will be lightning and thunder and an, a great earthquake. They will see small dark clouds in the east and a half a sized man's hand. The cloud will be bigger and brighter until it fills the sky and comes closer. We will see thousands of beautiful angels. We will see Jesus right in the middle, sitting on the throne. The Bible says, every eye will see him. That is Revelation chapter 1, verses 7. Everyone in the world will be watching. The people who love Jesus will be so, so happy. But those who did not love Jesus and obey Jesus will be afraid. They will want to hide, but there is nowhere to hide. Jesus will call out, awake, awake, you sleep in the dust and arise. As Jesus calls all the dead people who loved him will wake up, they will come out of their graves to go right up to Jesus. And then it will be our turn. If we love Jesus, he will call us to come too. Next, Jesus will take us to his incredible journey through space. One by one, we'll pass all the planets in our solar system, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, and finally, the dwarf planet Pluto. But that's just the beginning. We'll move right through our galaxy, the Milky Way, and we'll keep going. For seven days, we'll travel through space. We'll move faster 
than the speed of light, we will journey past millions of stars through the embassy galaxies, and we will see things we, we never knew existed. Finally, we'll reach the deepest part of outer space, somewhere be far beyond the farthest star. We will reach the most glorious place in the universe. The Bible calls it heaven. Jesus has planned many surprises for us in heaven. The Bible says we can't um, even imagine how glorious heaven is. But what if we miss heaven? Then we will miss the wonderful homes Jesus has prepared for us. We will miss eating the fruit from the tree of life. We will miss the beautiful new earth Jesus will make for us. We will, we will miss being with Jesus forever. We, if we miss heaven, we will miss it all. But we do not have to miss out on heaven. Jesus says, I want you to be there. I died for you so that you could live in heaven with me. Will you let me take charge of your life? and give you the power to do what's right? Maybe you are afraid to give Jesus your heart. Maybe you think that Jesus will want you to give up too much. Maybe there are some sins that you like very much. Maybe you think following Jesus will make you sad. Maybe you are afraid, you miserable if you are following him. These are th some lies that from Satan that he gives you. People who follow Jesus are the happiest people in the world. People who hold, hold on to their sins are the ones who are miserable. Won't you say yes to happiness? Won't you say yes to Jesus? Well, don't you want him to give your life to? Kneel with me as you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are kneeling because we all say yes to Jesus, Lord. We want him to take charge in every single part of our lives, Lord. And we want to be in the kingdom of heaven with you, Lord. So please help us to be ready, Lord, to meet Jesus when he comes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, what a great message. What a powerful message. Hi, everyone. I'm Pastor Martin. I'm a pastor here at College Park Church. And I hope you enjoy and we're blessed by tonight's message. It is our prayer that you sense God's call to let him into your life and we also hope that God works in your heart to have a closer relationship with Jesus. So, if you're interested, College Park Church offers Bible studies to help you get to know Jesus for yourself. You can stop by our church. Our church is located, it's College Park Church at 1164 King Street East. That's in Oshawa, Ontario, L1H1H9. Or you can contact us by phone, 905-725-1121. Or if it's even easier to shoot us an email, go ahead and do that. Our email is office at collegeparkchurch.ca. Let us know you're interested in continuing your journey to get to know Jesus for yourself. And we'd be happy to help. Bye for now.